Welcome to World Building Films, where we analyze the world, settings, and rules of films and TV shows to see if they work, if they don't, and if not, how they could be improved to enhance their stories. And I'm really excited for this one today because we're talking about none other than Stardust. Honestly, one of the most underrated movies I can think of. Which is weird, because while not everyone remembers it, those who do all unanimously have great fond memories of it. And frankly, it's rare not to expect anything but praise from an adaptation of a work by Neil Gaiman. Bless his soul. With that said, as fun and creative as it is, there are some questions that are left unanswered. So let's get right to them. And of course, before we start, don't forget to click the subscribe button for more great world building analysis and content in the future. Of course, beware of spoilers ahead. The Plot Set at the end of the 1800s in England, we start our story in the small village of Wall, called so because of a literal wall that, it turns out, separates our world from an entirely different and hidden one filled with magic called Stormhold. We're introduced to a young man named Tristan, birthed from the fun times between a man in England and the slave of a witch in Stormhold. Tristan is in love with a girl named Victoria, and in order to prove his love, he says he'll go retrieve a star from her that just fell from the sky beyond the wall. Ah, but see, it isn't just any star. At the same time, the king of Stormhold is dying. Since the way to choose the next king means to be the only sibling alive and his sons haven't killed each other yet, Woof, and I thought my family dinners were rough. Just before his death, the king launched a necklace containing a special jewel into the sky. And that jewel is the one that knocked down the star that Tristan was watching. And it turns out, the star is actually in the shape of a human woman called Yvain. And again at the same time, three old witches saw the star as well and decide to go hunt for it too, because if they manage to eat its heart, it will grant them youth once again and replenish their powers. As is shown when their leader Lamia eats the last fragment of the previous star's heart that they were keeping for emergencies. Tristan in the meantime is given a special candle from his father, called a Babylon candle, which accidentally transports him directly to Yvain. He decides to capture her, saying he'll release Yvain once he presents her to Victoria, keeping what's left of the Babylon candle for the trip back into the sky. Look guys, I know it looks bad and, well, it is, but look, it gets better, just trust me on this, okay? And so it's a race against time for Tristan to prove his love, the witches to regain their youth and power, and for the princes of Stormhold to all see who can succeed in their mission first, all while going on a series of adventures such as meeting unicorns, flying pirates who capture lightnings, with easily the best scene with Robert De Niro in film history. Magic spells, ghosts, sword fights, even cooler sword fights, and just everything a fantasy fan's heart could possibly desire. Alright, if you couldn't guess, I really, really do love this, and actually I'll stop here because this video is already going to be long and we gotta get to the meaty parts already. Now before we start, I should clarify that, yes, I'm aware that the book by Neil Gaiman that this is based on is actually a little different and, most importantly, it was just meant to be a simple modern fairy tale. So yes, I get it, because of that it's not meant to be taken too seriously and I might be overthinking a simple fairy tale. I know, but that's not my point. The film still presents itself as a little more than just a simple fairy tale and I still think that this is still some good food for thought. I mean, that is the point of this channel after all. Plus, if the film can go way more in depth with the flying pirates, which appear for like a page and a half in the book from what I'm told, I'm pretty sure I can do the same here. Oh, and apologies, but yeah, I haven't actually read the book myself, so we'll just be going with what the film is presenting. So, now that we got that all out of the way, it's time to finally get to it. Starting with... Stars. The whole plot revolves around the main idea of one star who has fallen down to Earth, and how her magical properties can do a lot, such as extend the life of whoever eats her heart, and even going solar flare against her enemies. Solar flare! And while they are a personification of our concept of stars, I can't go too wild on speculations on how this world works because, well, we literally do see Earth from outer space and frankly it's all perfectly normal. It's spherical, we see Europe and it's just floating in space. Alright, so no need to make too many wild assumptions. At least, for the most part. 
Cause see, there is one weird thing. When the king's stone does fly towards a vein in the sky, it knocks her down kind of immediately. The problem with that though is that stars are supposed to be like millions of light years away, regardless of what shape they're presented in. So what I'm wondering is not only how the hell did this stone travel that far and fast through space, but how did it make a vein fall that quickly and specifically in the direction towards Earth? Shouldn't she have been bonked further away? And then there's another small element that has some specific implications. When Tristan fell asleep in the woods, he's given visions and woken up by other stars in the sky who are trying to warn him about what the witches are about to do to Yvain and in how much trouble she is. They're specifically speaking to him almost telepathically. So what could big powerful beings hovering in the sky that can talk down to people in very selected times of need remind you of? That's right, I think that in this universe, stars aren't just giant balls of burning gas. Pumba, with you, everything's gas but instead, actual gods. If that's the case, there could be several new implications then. First off, this means that there's an entire pantheon of them, with perhaps one in particular that rules over all the others as their king or something, aka our sun when it brings daylight. It's not like the concept of one chief god amongst others is that foreign to us anyway. Looking at you, Zeus. So that could work out. Even the fact that they have human form would check out as well. Not only that, but they can even speak directly into the minds of humans and even give them visions. Think of all the times that we had historical figures like Joan of Arc or Moses who literally heard the word of God and told them what to do and how to act. It might have just been these stars all along. Plus, it would give even more reason for their hearts to have such great power if eaten. Because humans would literally be eating the source of a whole goddamn deity, and that's why it gives them great longevity, and in some cases, even power. And heck, this is written by Gaiman, who's an expert at writing gods as characters, so this can only check out even more. But that begs the question. If these are literal gods in the sky, in which case Tristan really did hit the jackpot with Yvain, I'm a really good lawyer. And it is implied that this is still our regular Earth where all our history has been the same at least up to the Victorian era that this is based on, then why don't humans worship the stars just as they are? Are the stars actually the Greek, Chinese, Mesopotamian, Hindu, Christian or whatever gods all hanging around together in the sky? No, I actually don't think so. For one, even if we do have plenty of gods throughout all our cultures and histories, I'm pretty sure there aren't as many as there are actual stars in the sky. So who are the rest? And second, when Tristan is seeing his vision of what happened to the previous star who fell on Earth, aside from her hair color, she looks pretty damn similar to Yvain, wearing the same silky silvery dress even, kind of implying that that's what all stars look like. So with these points in mind, if the stars are actual gods, why haven't they revealed themselves to us humans as just that? How come this is a world where it's implied that we had our own pantheons but that had nothing to do with them? Well to answer that, we need to enter our second topic, and that is… Babylon Candles Now I don't know about you, but while these candles are really cool and super useful, I always wondered one thing. Why the hell are these specifically called Babylon candles? Well, I started doing some digging and found something very interesting. For those of you who don't know, Babylon was the capital of the Babylonian Empire in ancient Mesopotamia, known for being a great developing city back in the day. It also originated the myth of the Tower of Babel, a massive tower that was built in a time when everyone spoke the same language to reach the heavens, but then God, outraged, caused languages to be split so people would be too disorganized to complete the tower. So regarding this myth, if we keep our idea that the stars are actually gods looming over us, we can say that it wasn't a myth at all, but an actual historical fact here. Except that it was the stars who, with their ability to speak directly into the minds of humans as we saw with Tristan's warning, were the ones who caused languages to split and the tower never to be completed, because they didn't want humans to successfully rise all the way up to them. And in fact, to answer our previous point of why we humans haven't worshipped them as stars through our history, perhaps they wanted to make so sure that we wouldn't try it again that they used their telepathic abilities to also change people's perceptions of what gods look like. 
ensuring that every culture would have their own view as to what a deity would look like instead of just regular stars. So humans would keep bickering with each other over this detail and never get together again for one clear mission. The reason we would have had different deities in our religions was because it was an illusion imposed on us for having attempted to breach the heavens eons ago. With all this in mind, it would also connect to the Babylon candles. Literal wax candles that, when lit up, can transport you wherever you like. So, while we'll get into more detail later on this, what if the tower was made using also a strange magical material to make sure it was sound and solid enough to reach all the way up there? Except, as mentioned before, the stars didn't like this and intervened. Heck, we could even add our own spin and say that, aside from splitting languages for humans, the stars literally helped burn or melt this tower for good. And if they did do this, perhaps at the same time, this material, when melted, absorbed some of their divine powers and was later extracted by humans in the form of this strange black wax. This theory works in particular, in fact, if you consider that this material that they'd use in candle form can only work and harness the stored star power inside if you decide to light it up. AKA, you have to make it shine. And on the note of this material, we could even say that if treated in a different way that would harden it, say, instead of turning it into wax, they turned it into something akin to glass, they could even be used as weapons. Specifically, the same weapons the witches want to use to cut out Evane's heart. They do make it clear that these things are fundamental for the process, after all. It is you and not we who've lost her. Lost her and broken the knife. Even if you apprehend her, how will you complete the deed? And the reason for that could be that it is the only thing that could actually harm a star. Because just like the candles, these knives are saturated with their power when they destroyed the Tower of Babel. The only thing that can kill a star is something that can match its own power. I mean, both these knives and the candle are pretty dark in color with particular textures too, so I see no reason as to why we can't draw this conclusion. The rarity of this material checks out as well, quite frankly, considering that even the witches point out that they're hard to get your hands on. You speak as if such things are freely available. But we're not done yet in talking about Babylon's influence, because the other topic we will now discuss is... Stormhold. So now that we analyzed what happened with the myth of Babylon, let's also analyze one aspect of its real history. One of the kings of Babylon, Hammurabi, was considered to be the greatest ruler in the city's history. But after he passed away, the son, or even sons plural, based on a couple of references I found, that took over later turned out to be more incompetent and unorganized than his or their father, slowly bringing the fall of the empire that would last for hundreds of years. So for our case, over time, the tales of what happened to Babylon and how it fell, especially with the incompetence of Hanarabi's son or sons to continue the job, would carry on as a tradition all the way to the foundation of Stormhold. Because yes, as you might have guessed, the historical events could have influenced the way the modern royal succession there is chosen, by having as many offsprings as possible and creating a tradition where they all have to kill each other first so only the strongest of them has a chance to rule. Hell, at this point, we could even say that the stone the king used was some sort of magical relic from the divine powers of the stars used way back in Babylon, when they intervened to stop the construction of the tower. Maybe a single piece of that star that, separated from its hole, when in the official possession of humans, could become quote-unquote stained by their influence to the point that it turns red and clear when released, with perhaps just the smallest amount of human influence still inside it after being on Earth for so many generations. And when released, it tries to return to its owners in the sky, in the process staining and quote-unquote humanizing or depowering the star in question with that small trace left inside, until she's unfit to live in the heavens above and is knocked down with the rest of us mortals. And since the princes of Stormhold in the film hadn't finished killing each other yet, since he probably felt he was about to die, the king saw it fit to up 
up the stakes by telling them to retrieve the necklace, knowing full well that this time the victor would not just be the strongest among them, but so strong that he'd be worthy of ruling over Stormhold for several lifetimes if they found Yvain as well. King forever. Now with all that said, there is the issue of how Stormhold became what it is in the events of the film. Or more specifically, why is it a kingdom that's locked away behind a wall? And to answer that, we enter the final topic of this video, and that is... The Witches out of all the elements and implications in the film, the one thing that kept raising questions in my head were by far the witches. Why? Well, simply put, how the hell are they not utterly ruling over Stormhold or even the whole freaking world? I mean, just look at what the hell they can do! They can transform people, force them to tell the truth, manipulate them with freaking voodoo dolls, call each other on goddamn Skype, shoot fire, and even just create massive freaking buildings! Seriously, why are they not the ones controlling everything? Even assuming that Lamia is the one who can do the most of this because it's implied that she's the queen of them, I shall not seek the star, your dark majesty. The others can still do a lot, and only a fraction of these powers would be enough to gain the upper hand on anything. So what's the deal here? Why aren't they in control? Well, it got me thinking, and I think there could be an explanation for it all. See, before Yvain is about to cross the wall separating England from Stormhold, we're told that stars, if they do cross it, will disintegrate and turn into stardust. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! And while the film says that it happens only to stars, I realize that we never actually got to see any of the witches cross the wall either. And sure, they just happen not to, but why don't we take that literally? And if we did take this idea that neither stars nor witches can cross the wall into the regular human world, then that leads to a very interesting new concept. Thus, I propose that Stormhold isn't just a magical land hidden beyond the wall, but instead an actual prison built to contain the witches inside. Do I need to remind you that wall is not part of our universe? Why? Well, it would connect once again to the idea of the Tower of Babel. Perhaps we could say that in ancient history, magic was available pretty much everywhere, with plenty of people who could use it, aka witches and warlocks. And yes, since Lamia pointed out that they're a thing, There's someone following your tracks! A witch? A warlock? I'm going to roll with it. These spells and this magic, by the way, could have also been used to help with the construction of the Tower of Babel. Cause let's face it, we can barely do that nowadays, imagine the people back in antiquity. You'd need some magical help with this. And since such magic power, if brought to the heavens by humans, could be a risk towards stars because of the human influence they could leave, as mentioned before in our previous theory regarding the stone, that's why the stars themselves disrupted everything and made sure that the tower couldn't be constructed anymore. But there's a problem, because if humans tried it once, they could one day try it again. Because let's face it, they can't use splitting languages as their only guarantee. So, the stars might have intervened one last time, where if they couldn't get rid of human magic on Earth entirely, perhaps because it still had to exist somewhere in this universe, otherwise even they would be powerless or something like that, they decided to instead just confine it to one single limited location. A magical parallel world perfectly adjacent to ours. And if you think that having magic concentrated into one location would just make it that much stronger and more concentrated, you'd actually be right. And so, we can say that that is where the Sky Pirates come in. Because perhaps all this surplus of magic is indeed discharging as an excess of lightning, which the pirates are collecting and storing away to dilute the amount of power witches can have available within the kingdom. Magic so saturated, in fact, that even the clouds themselves could be dense with it, to the point they become solid and one could even walk on them, as we even see Yvain and Tristan do. In fact, at this point, even the unicorns can have a purpose in all of this. Cause the one we do see in the film serves the purpose of freeing Yvain from her chain. 
You know, that magic chain that is supposedly eternally unbreakable, yet with a slice of its horn, it just evaporates. In this scenario then, their horns could have perhaps the unique ability to even nullify magic in all its forms, including whatever dangerous or problematic spell the witches might have conjured. The unicorns, along with the pirates, would be put in place in this magical parallel world to keep in check the magic available for the witches. Heck, while this might be even pushing it a bit, it could even tie in with naming the kingdom Stormhold. Holding back a metaphorical and possibly literal storm of danger should the witches break free. It's all one giant prison built to keep them in their place because they're too high a risk. And since it was physically limited compared to the rest of the world, with this scenario, and with our idea of the Sky Pirates, so would the magic inside be limited, making the witches and warlocks much weaker as well. They could use some magic, but they absolutely had to rely on external sources as fuel, such as eating the heart of a star should it ever fall, otherwise they'd easily run out. This theory checks out too because, for one, when Lamia is using her magic after ingesting the last piece of star from centuries ago, any amount used slowly aged her up. And since there's no reason to assume that a full star's heart is any bigger than a regular human one, sure it'll make their powers last longer, but even then they'd have to be extremely conservative with how much they use their refueled magic, especially if they want to use it for centuries by the time another star might hypothetically fall. And the second reason this checks out too could be the way they use their currencies. If you recall, in the beginning, Una, while a slave for the witch, was going to trade a flower for Dunstan, Tristan's father when he was younger, in exchange for... They might be the color of your hair, or they might be all of your memories before you were three. Very weird choice of currency to say the least, especially considering that the Sky Pirates want coin in exchange for their lightning bolts. Regular money does exist. But it makes sense for the witches because these physical or emotional details could be small drops of fuel for their magic. Just like how emotions or things linked to emotions are the very thing that makes a star shine bright. It's not much when stars aren't around, but better to have crumbs than nothing at all. And thus, this would be the fate of the witches, living in a prison just beyond the reach of the real world, as punishment from the stars for being too powerful and having tried to reach the heavens in the past. Stormhold and its inhabitants would then have simply been the people keeping them in check, by order of the stars, keeping a watchful eye and making sure they'd remain there and not cause future trouble making sure they wouldn't escape, and at the same time, making sure the rest of the world isn't even aware of this, so no one gets the bright idea of letting them loose and making magic return to the rest of the world. All of this regardless of how the people of Stormhold feel about it, or how much they'd love to see the rest of the real world again, as implied by characters such as Captain Shakespeare. Guards trapped inside as much as their own prisoners. Now however, this begs another question. What now? Sure, the witches are defeated, unless there were others roaming around, and Tristan and Yvain have their happily ever after. But now that the main threat is gone, what's the point of letting Stormhold exist? Well, with this whole scenario, I propose that after Yvain spent decades on Earth with Tristan, and she returns to the sky with him, she could use him as proof that humans aren't as unworthy or dangerous to reach the skies as previously thought, and that perhaps a merging of their worlds and even daring to become a little more human wouldn't be as tragic. Especially now that they helped eradicate the threat of witches once and for all, or at least its biggest baddie. And since humans were already on the brink of scientific progress and discovery, in this future the stars would allow humans to continue on with their discoveries, looking into the night sky, and discover that the stars are actually people. And then one can speculate all they want on how our present day would be influenced, for better or worse, by the notion that there are literal powerful beings looming over us. Be it outrage of religious believers that what they trusted in was a lie, fascination at what the reality of the universe and its secrets could mean, or perhaps a bit of both. So that was Stardust. And to this day, despite there being some unanswered questions as we just saw, I still consider it to be one of the best examples of storytelling made for a fantasy film. 
Sure, some stuff could have been clarified, and admittedly the VFX were bad even by 2007 standards, but almost everything else of it works. From the story to the dialogue, the humor, the action, the epic music, the sets, the characters, the acting, the acting, the directing, and just so much more. And if you didn't see it yet, I highly encourage you do, and then recommend it to as many people as you can, because if there's one thing this film deserves, it's to shine. Anyway, that's all for today, folks. What do you think? Am I right? Am I wrong? Am I talking out of my ass? Maybe. Let me know in the comments down below. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Please consider subscribing to my Patreon to help support what I do here. And if there's any other franchise whose world building you'd like analyzed, let me know. Until next time, keep building worlds.